Well, good evening, everybody out there. Um, welcome to the National Building Arts Center's National Historic Preservation Month lecture. I'm Michael Allen. I'm the executive director at the National Building Arts Center. Um, and before I introduce our esteemed guests for tonight's lecture, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the National Building Arts Center and upcoming programs. I see some familiar faces out there. I'm glad we can see each other, and hopefully that plays a good role in our question and answer later. Um, but I know some of you are coming in because we've extended a virtual welcome to the entire nation um, to build new friends and supporters. Uh, and I'm very glad to see uh, some new faces. Um, so if you're not familiar with the National Building Arts Center, briefly, uh, I invite you to check out our website and social media. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, we hold the nation's largest collection of architectural artifacts and one of the largest architectural research libraries on um, the built environment, historic preservation, and allied arts related to architecture and engineering. We're headquartered here in this former steel foundry first section built in 1921, just across the river from the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. We are in the heart of the heart of the country, a great place to launch this national effort to try to bring people together around historic preservation and the building arts. Uh, here's just a view, one area, one of our warehouses, and you can see the vast expanse of our collection. We literally hold hundreds of thousands of artifacts. Uh, in addition to that, we hold um, almost as many in our research library. Um, and here's a view of our library. This is the former shower room for the workers at the foundry. Um, so we welcome you to come to St. Louis sometime and visit our collections. Um, our project began with uh, the initiative of our founder, Larry Giles, uh, historic preservationist and architectural salvager who started dismantling buildings um, through a commercial practice and eventually a vast collecting practice uh, in 1973. Uh, Larry, at that point, did not realize he was going to launch this museum, um, but for the last 20 years or so, this has been forming into a museum project. Unfortunately, Larry uh, dis died in 2021, um, but in the last 18 months, we've been busy building the institution and carrying on his legacy through uh, admitting researchers, uh, contributing to uh, public programs and exhibitions, uh, hosting tours, uh, and since last summer, lectures like the one you're about to enjoy uh, this evening. Uh, so I want to invite you uh, to our summer lecture series if you're in St. Louis. Uh, and even if you're not, uh, our future lectures this summer will be uh, held at our campus underneath the steel casting shed, which is, believe it or not, quite a comfortable uh, summer uh, venue, fully outdoors almost. Um, so I'm uh, happy to uh, announce our first summer lecture will be the Philippine Village Historic Site by a uh, lecture from a uh, local artist and activist, Jana Anyanuevo Langholz on uh, June 14th, Flag Day, um, followed by a panel discussion on statues and liberties, what uh, stories monuments tell us. Myself, Professor Jeff Ward and Stephanie Weisberg will uh, hold down the fort on that day, uh, July 12th. Uh, and then we'll have the repair and conservation of terracotta, a different direction, from Master Conservator Peter Wollenberg on August 9th. This answers some of our feedback from last summer's lecture series. Folks wanted a deeper dive into local history, um, some of the cultural dimensions explained, but also material know-how. And I think we have a good balance uh, starting with tonight's lecture and carrying through August. Um, if you are coming to St. Louis at any point or already are in St. Louis, we have second Saturday tours every month of the year at 11 a.m. Tickets available through our website. I've posted the link in the chat for the lectures and the tours. Um, these are at 11 a.m. Uh, and they uh, take you through both the library and the, the site. Um, if you want to plan a more uh, destination visit to see our collection, um, you might want to come later in the year after this uh, replica of the Statue of Liberty. Little Liberty makes its journey starting next week from the Brooklyn Museum in New York, which is um, generously donating this to us in addition to other donations over the years. Uh, Little Liberty will be wending her way across country uh, to St. Louis, but there's more in store. We have to restore the statue, repair uh, uh, some of the, the uh, damage it'll incur in shipping, some of the deterioration it's incurred since um, being transported to the Brooklyn Museum. We have to finish its base. We have to give it a bright coat of paint. We have to make it publicly presentable. So if you go to our website, you'll also notice we have a GoFundMe campaign currently and any donation from $1 on up will 
um, get you um, recognition in our um, uh, website. Um, Hundred dollars in the program and five thousand dollars in your name will be permanently affixed to the Statue of Liberty on the base of this replica. So um, check it out. Even if you don't donate, you're welcome to come visit the statue later this year. Um, and also later this year, we're very pleased to announce a big debut of our collection at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation on September eighth. Um, we will have a major curated exhibition that I'm curating with the assistance of uh, Stephanie Weisberg at the Pulitzer. Um, we're going to take these artifacts out of the warehouses and yards, it, the foundry, and into a traditional museum setting, um, something you've never seen before. Only small amounts of our collection have been displayed over the years. This is our first real attempt at showing a, what a museum made out of this collection might look like. Uh, and there'll be many programs during the duration of the exhibition. And so I welcome you to come back to St. Louis uh, in the fall. Um, or, of course, if you're already here, please join us um, many times. Um, so we're busy in this year. We feel like this is the busiest year yet, and I think next year we'll probably top that record and hopefully uh, each year in success after that. Um, a very young museum project, and we're very glad to um, host this lecture tonight. Um, for National Historic Preservation Month, and I'm going to stop the share and turn it over to our guests now. For National Historic Preservation Month, we thought we should um, really explore uh, something at the forefront of historic preservation, a new practice um, led by Elizabeth Blasius and Jonathan Solomon, um, veteran preservationist and architect, um, with many years pondering the issues of the field of historic preservation uh, and the cultural dimensions of the built environment. Uh, they run a firm started two years ago called Preservation Futures. Um, so if we're building a new practice at National Building Arts Center, they've been almost building it step by step since 2021 alongside us. Um, their work, uh, with the James R. Thompson Center, postmodern work of architecture in Chicago that the AIA guide once deemed either breathtaking or exhausting. And personally, I think those are both excellent attributes. Um, if you're exhausted after winning the Boston Marathon, that's not a bad thing. Um, this, this is a, a building that has gone through a struggle for preservation um, that's been fairly successful as we'll hear, but not without pitfalls along the way. Um, and I think Jonathan and Elizabeth are, are uh, compatriots and understanding that the dimensions to historic preservation are uh, fall into three categories, none of which are mutually exclusive. The technical, how things are preserved or if they can be preserved. The cultural, whether people care or value them enough to preserve them. Uh, and the legal, which is a huge uh, buildup that our movement has uh, created through laws at the local, state and federal levels. This project encompasses navigating all three of those channels. Uh, and I'm very proud to turn uh, this lecture over to Elizabeth and Jonathan for the duration of the evening. Um, just as a housekeeping note, I'll keep everyone on mute until the very end and then jump in with questions. But if you have a point along the way, feel free to use the chat. Jonathan, Elizabeth, take it away. There we go. Okay, you'll have to unmute us, I was saying, at, at a minimum. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Lashes. And I am Jonathan Solomon. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. We're both humbled and proud that so many people have an interest in our practice and our work on the Thompson Center. Thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you, Michael and the National Building Arts Center for this invitation. We are founders of Preservation Futures, a firm in Chicago exploring the future of historic preservation through research, action, and design. Preservation Futures goes beyond historic preservation's traditional approach to saving buildings to identify and shepherd future landmarks that elevate the social and cultural history embedded in places and spaces. We founded our firm because we believe that preservation work should be mission-driven, that it must be collaborative and curatorial, ethical, and where necessary, radical to be effective. Tonight, we'll introduce our practice, move into telling you about one of our projects, the pre preservation of the 1985 James R. Thompson Center in Chicago, and what we can learn from it about the future of preservation. All right. Um, architectural preservation, as, as Michael alluded to in his brief introduction of us, as a professional field uh, practiced in the United States, largely operates in uh, two areas. The first is the science of building materials, 
uh, and the processes involved in stabilizing or holding them in fixed and pure conditions. In this way, preservation operates like the field of conservation in the world of art by determining a, mo a moment when a building is finished and then working to recover and arrest that state. The second area that preservation operates in is the area of law uh, and the force of law to discourage or to incentivize actions that are relevant to the work of recovery and stasis. In this way, preservation operates like a regulated market in the world of economics by seeking to restrain or guide the forces of development capitalism towards preferred ends. But preservation as an activity more broadly is um, fundamental to human life. We preserve in the first instance, things like foods, uh, jams, pickles, cheese, meat, etc. cetera. Um, and around these acts of preservation, we develop something we call a culture. Um, actually two different types of culture, uh, the culture of microbes that collaborate with us in the fermentation process and also social cultures. Uh, we preserve knowledge, stories, understanding, and other reminders of who we are and what makes us us. This culturing through care is what we want to move the practice of preservation closer to through our work. It is worth remembering that architectural preservation as a profession in America was founded at a particular moment and through specific legislation, the National Historic Preservation Act or NEPA of 1966. And that as a system of values, it remains an artifact of its time. Who do we consider to be an important architect and who do we not? What do we even consider to be a historic property and what do we not? Systemic biases embedded in federal criteria for evaluating a property's significance both serve and perpetuate elite histories while actively excluding others. These criteria uh, include things like the notoriety of the architect, uh, its architect, uh, architectural style of a building, uh, and the quality of a building's architectural integrity. Shifting preservation's values from historically important architects and styles or building integrity back to timeless practices of cultural significance and environmental stewardship make the practice of preservation more inclusive of the populations it serves. This opens preservation from a potentially narrow and elitist practice of guarding capital into a broad project of incentivizing care. Preservation is more than just one story. Preservation's traditional approach to saving buildings considered by experts to have architectural value is both narrow and burdened by implicit and explicit biases. Preservation isn't only for buildings and value isn't solely defined by expertise. History is made of multiple overlapping and sometimes contradictory stories. Preservation must acknowledge that no single story is more deserving than others and embrace complexity and contradiction in its work. In our work to rename uh, and reinterpret Chicago's oldest house, the Clark Ford House pictured here, uh, we are centering the work of a black faith community as stewards of the house for 40 years uh, that had been obfuscated uh, in favor of a primary narrative of um, colonial era history of white settlement. Preservation is both legislative and creative. Sometimes the best way to ensure a story is told is to work through preservation policy. Other times stories emerge from creative engagement with people and communities. Preservation must both execute legislation and develop and encourage creative practices that pass on history. In our work, preserving the former Schlitz Tide House at 94th Street and Ewing Avenue on Chicago's east side, pictured here, We've relied both on the legislative power of landmark designation to bring recognition and funding to the building's owner who is renovating, uh, restoring the property as a, a bar and community space called the East Side Tap, and on developing programming and events at the space that evolve its history as a music venue and cultural hub for a changing neighborhood. Preservation is for everyone. Part of the right to the city is a right to history. Everyone deserves access to the benefits associated with historic preservation, regardless of their capital, and regardless of where their story fits into majority narratives. Preservation must better serve communities that it has traditionally ignored. 
In our work for the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley House, we are developing an oral history archive and curatorial plan with its owners, the environmental justice organization Blacks and Green, uh, the Till family, and Westwood Lawn neighbors. The results of this project, which are supported by the National Trust, uh, will be part of an exhibit at the house that we are collaborating on with architect Jermaine Barnes this summer. Preservation is both collaborative and, and ongoing. The work of preservation isn't always visible. There is never a single author to a preservation outcome, and the work of preservation is never complete. Preservationists provide support for preservation policy, participate in processes that increase the public good, and work with people to illuminate their stories. Our ongoing research includes recent studies of the efficacy of Chicago's 20-year-old demolition delay ordinance uh, and the city's decade-old decision to shutter over 50 uh, Chicago public schools buildings. Preservation is about the future. And in fact, we baked that right into the name of our firm. Preservation must embrace the Herculean maxim that change is the only constant. Preservation's goal is to connect the past, present, and future through research, action, and design so that we might all change together into an increasingly better world. Our work to preserve the Will County Courthouse in, in Joliet, Illinois, rests on the environmental imperative of adaptive reuse but also on a last and crucial element of our work, how to assess and interpret the value of buildings of the comparatively recent past and why doing so in America is so vital and urgent right now. What should preservation's relationship be with the recent past, the present, or even the future? This question brings us to the work, uh, to our work to preserve the James R. Thompson Center. In 2020, the 1980s turn 40. Um, I like to give, as a person born in the 1970s, I actually like to say that the that the 1970s turned 50, a fact that I'm very acutely aware of, um, you know, given, given my own uh, rapidly increasing age. When the James R. Thompson Center opened uh, as, quote, a building for the year 2000, which is what the banner at its, uh, at its in, in, uh, commissioning read, uh, in 1985, that uh, future uh, was, was actually identified. It was 15 years ahead, right, um, the year 2000. And it is now 20 years in the past. So let's get into um, the building and our findings on its value. The, um, the James R. Thompson Center, formerly the State of Illinois Center, opened in Chicago's North Loop in 1985. It was designed by Helmut Jahn. Uh, and uh, the 17 story structure contains just over a million square feet. It's distinguished by its curving, reflective facade and full height, 160 foot diameter public atrium. A state office building and a hub for government services the building housed tenants, including uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Illinois Court of Claims, and the offices of agencies such as the Illinois State Board of Education. The building was also the Chicago District Office of um, the Governor of Illinois, the actual capital of Illinois, of course, um, for, the, for our national guests tonight being located in Springfield. But beyond these uses, the building has also been many other things, including a test for new architectural aesthetics and technology, an expression of unique cultural and political conditions of the 1980s, and a site for public protest and advocacy. After 30 years of deferred maintenance, the state of Illinois declared uh, that it could no longer afford the upkeep of the Thompson Center, and announced an intention to sell it to a private developer. After a lengthy process interrupted by several uh, gubernatorial elections and the COVID-19 pandemic, a private developer in Chicago, Prime Group, bought the building in uh, 2021, shortly, uh, bought the building in 2021. Shortly after um, the sale, uh, software uh, giant Google announced that it would buy the building from Prime Group, who would be renovating it with the architecture firm Jan, the firm founded by the late Helmut Jan, uh, who uh, was uh, uh, killed in an untimely uh, traffic accident the year of the sale. 
parallel to this process, uh, we worked alongside a host of various collaborators on both creative and legislative campaigns to interpret the building's value and to incentivize its care. In approaching our work on the Thompson Center, we were mindful of the precedent of Chicago's Prentice Women's Hospital, designed by Bertrand Goldberg in 1975 and demolished in 2014, despite a well-organized campaign by preservationists, architects, and others to save it. The lesson we took from the Prentice experience was that a top-down approach to advocating for a building's value had limitations. Neither the role of a significant architect nor the architectural value of the design were enough to convince the building's private owner, Northwestern Hospital, that it was worth repurposing. We were also mindful of this example, the Chicago Cultural Center, built in 1897 at the, as the Chicago Public Library. By the mid-1960s, a discussion developed around the superiority of new and modern suburban libraries over the mediocrity and obsolescence of the existing library. While preservationists guided an eight-year effort to save the building from demolition, listing it on the National Register of Historic Places in 1972 and designating it a Chicago landmark in 1976, it was the public, the users, the library card holders, the librarians, and the workers that amplified the public value of the building, whether it was to remain a library or be reused. The campaign gave the building the colloquial name, the People's Palace. There is no firsting in preservation. We recognize, however, that new challenges need different and sometimes differently combined approaches. Our work on the Thompson Center began with multiple overlapping approaches, including free public tours of what was still at the time a public space. We wanted to show Chicago that it was a postmodern people's palace, and this started with individuals. Our tours focused on the role of the building as a site for public protest, its relationship to the cultural history of the 1980s, and the past, present, and future of the Chicago Loop. There was also, there also a way to build coalitions and have fun. Here, for example, is a Thompson Center super fan at our October 31st, 2019 tour, dressed in a homemade Thompson Center costume. Carlos Ramirez Rosa, alderman of Chicago's 35th Ward, joined a tour to relate his experiences as a teenager, changing trains at the Thompson Center on his way home from school and doing homework in the food court. Alderman Rosa also addressed the value of the building's public spaces today for the people who live and work in and travel through the loop. Alderman Rosa's experience with the building was similar to the experiences of others who joined the tours and engaged with our work. Users of the building appreciated its uniqueness as well as the centralized services it offered. These opinions were counter to the negative tropes you've all heard about the building. Instead of the food court being a nuisance, users appreciated it as a place where you could get anything from a familiar affordable favorite like Sabaro or Taco Bell, or try something new like a plate of soul food from Ruby's or Bibimbap from City Rock Korean Kitchen. Over 150 people attended our tours, including workers in the building, classes of students from both the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the Illinois Institute of Technology, and visitors from schools abroad, colleagues and folks who just happened upon us during their lunch hour. A simple survey tool shown here helped us track what preconceptions those who attended brought with them and how we impacted their opinions. Uh, concurrently with the tours, we produced a podcast for SoundCloud um, called Conversations in the Food Court, where we spoke with uh, people about their experiences in the Thompson Center's public spaces, in the Thompson Center's public spaces. Guests included uh, urban explorer and photographer Kelly D'Angelo, Chicago tour guide Margaret Hicks, urban designer Paula Aguirre, realtor and preservationist Susanna Ribstein, uh, Chicago uh, Tribune food and dining reporter Louisa Chu, and artist Alberto Ortega. In the winter of 2020, we supported an exhibition by Chicago artist and designer Chelsea Lombardo at Space P11, a gallery near the Thompson Center. Part interactive sculpture and part performance, Chelsea crafted a Thompson Center pinata and invited the public to fill it with opinions, memories, and reactions, uh, reflections on the building. In an event at the gallery, guests, including um, the architect's granddaughters, were invited to smash the pinata, and uh, Chelsea then read aloud from the deposited messages. Preservation is a collaborative effort. 
Uh, and in order to strengthen that effort, we began working with a coalition of parties, including Landmarks Illinois and Preservation Chicago, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the American Institute of Architects, uh, and DOCOMOMO. Um, this coalition helped guide advocacy, amplifying the advantages of adaptive reuse uh, from benefits of saving the building from a sustainability perspective to issues surrounding transportation equity relating to the description of service to relocate or reconfigure the CTA station. The coalition gathered research from partners and provided a summary to the firm tapped to help the state of Illinois manage the sale. Over time, we were able to see changes in opinion in the popular press. This was the headline in the Chicago Sun-Times in 2017. In this article, the editorial board relied on tired tropes, love it or hate it, and reports from dissatisfied state workers living with the consequences of neglect to argue that the building should be sold and scrapped without ever questioning why such a neglect had happened in the first place. But this was the headline in 2021. In a far more reflective piece, the editorial board now takes the position that incentives for reuse should be made available as a part of any sale. The board also shows far more interest in the specifics of any transaction and questions whether the value from a sale would balance the loss of a public resource. By 2020, um, of course, uh, several things were happening at once. Um, in March, as you recall, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, caused the closure of public spaces across the world, including the Thompson Center. With the building shut, uh, to both the public and to employees, we struggled with how to proceed with our work. Uh, we could no longer gather for tours in the atrium or record episodes of our podcast in the food court. Instead, we shifted attention uh, to the legislative side of our strategy. With generous support from Landmarks Illinois and the National Trust, we began the work of nominating the Thompson Center to the National Register of Historic Places. As we wrote the nomination, we kept multiple uses for it in mind. A National Register nomination would uh, a listing would help legitimize the preservation of postmodernism, but it would also provide attractive incentives to a private developer in the form of federal or state historic tax credits, which could be the difference between whether the building was purchased and reused or demolished and sent to a landfill. The National Register nomination process was far from typical. The nomination required identification of an architectural style based on time period, uh, postmodernism in the case of 1985, and there were very few examples from this category. We had to make a very strong case for the building's high level of architectural significance to be measured against its comparatively young age. The nomination was both delayed and obstructed by the state of Illinois, presumably to prevent its listing disrupting the sale of the building to the private sector. And finally, um, Helmut Jan's tragic and untimely death occurred only a week after we sent our first draft to the State Historic Preservation Office. The process to nominate the building from beginning to conclusion took almost three years. But embarking on the nomination uh, of the Thompson Center uh, was also an opportunity to rigorously consider and convey why this building is valuable. Uh, and we communicated that value through the National uh, Register nomination to the public through a, a legislative document. And so we're gonna we're gonna kind of move in our talk at this point to talking about some of the specifics from our research and analysis of what that value uh, is. That meant contemplating the architecture, but also broadly, what does it mean to be a public space? Since it was completed in 1985, the Thompson Center has been Chicago's front yard for protests and rallies. This is where people speak and Chicago and Illinois listens. Protesting is legal and it is within our first amendment right and part of American life. In Chicago, you can protest with no permit if you use a publicly owned sidewalk or a publicly owned plaza. The Thompson Center's plaza gathers protesters seeking to voice their frustration of city, county, state, and federal actions. It provides a stage for this, this type of action. This is what public space is and should be. Name a movement or um, 
in action in Chicago, Cook County, the state of Illinois, or the federal government, or even international issues since the building was put in service to the people of Illinois. And it has been protested inside and outside of the Thompson Center. That's embedded in the history of the building. Community activists and even our elected officials have taken to this building to peacefully assemble, fulfilling one of the goals of the building's design, to explore concepts of government and the sense of patriotism that lives within those that ask for more from democracy. The building's color palette represents this, and, is, and it has become a place of dissent against the unjust acts of our government and governments around the world. In 1986, nearly 1,000 people filed into the Thompson Center in support of ending apartheid in South Africa. In 1998, young people in Chicago gathered in front of Jean, du, Jean Dubuffet's monument with Standing Beast to protect then-Governor James Thompson's cuts to the state's summer employment budget. Architecturally, the Thompson Center rejects the modern style, the rigors of the modern style, and embraces classical ideals of civic unity and state power in a postmodern aesthetic. In contrast to the asymmetrical, universal, and corporate modernist government buildings of the period in Chicago and the United States, the Thompson Center is filled with references to both history and place. Specifically, the domed design of capitals and government buildings in the United States, uh, and in the words of the architect, uh, quote, European town squares. The dome on the Thompson Center recalls specifically the dome on the Illinois State Capitol in Springfield, uh, which dates to 1867, uh, as well as that of Chicago's federal building, former federal building, uh, the, the uh, Henry Ives Cobb building built in 1905 and demolished in 1965 to make way for the modernist uh, federal center. The um, tile pattern in the Thompson Center's central atrium similarly recalls uh, the plaza in the Campidoglio in Rome, while the bold color scheme was meant as a pastel take on red, white, and blue. The granite colonnade and other detailing, such as the large scale keystone motif in the patterning of the curtain wall above the LaSalle Street entrance contained references to classical detailing while emphasizing thinness over solidity. The colonnade both referenced historical forms and suggested a trust in urbanism at a time when the North Loop uh, and American cities generally uh, suffered depopulation and disinvestment. This confidence was mirrored in the building's role as a transit hub, connects the train to O'Hare International Airport with every elevated line, uh, train line in the city. And it's three-dimensional urbanism uh, through the pedestrian pedway under the Chicago Loop, the trains above it and the streets around it, welcomes the public into three levels of shopping and dining. At the same time, the Thompson Center pushed boundaries in materials and technology to represent the complexity and contradiction of American life in the 1980s, with a focus on the evolving role of government in the lives of the individual. At a surface level, Jan achieved this with a muted red, white, and blue color scheme. In layers of complexity, he took cues from shopping mall design, including an open atrium with a food court and water feature, mirrored and reflective surfaces, and exposed elevators and escalators for an effect that architecture critic Paul Goldberger characterized as hyperactive. This space is part European, Times Square, uh, European Town Square and part another important model of civic space in America. We're in a shopping mall, a shopping mall where government happens. The Thompson Center erases expected boundaries between interior and exterior and between building and infrastructure, confounding easy delineations of public and private space. Rather than expressing state power, as one might expect, given its tenants, the building screens structures of government behind material and spatial spectacle. The history of the Thompson Center begins in the 1970s, as Chicago was looking for ways to revitalize the North Loop. State Street had found what was believed to be an answer in closing the roadway to cars in 1979, a move inspired by suburban shopping centers and the success of the magnificent mile north of the river. Chicago had determined that multiple blocks in the area containing mid-sized scale commercial buildings dating from the late 19th century were blighted. Through the establishment of a TIF district, Chicago flexed its eminent domain authority. 
Meanwhile, then Governor James R. Thompson was seeking to move the state's operations in Chicago from the then state of Illinois building, now the Michael A. Blandick building at 160 North LaSalle Street into a new structure. Part of his argument was that the existing state of Illinois building, and this is interesting, was inefficient and outdated. Based on the blight of argument, the city of Chicago acquired a lot where the JFTC now sits, demolishing four structures. At that time, the Chicago Landmarks Division was protecting works in neighborhoods like Schurz High School in Old Irving Park, the Rose Hill Cemetery entrance in, in Lincoln Square, and the Robeson Houses in Douglas, but were curiously not landmarking things in the North Loop, and that included um, some calls by preservationists to um, preserve some of the buildings that were in um, on the site of the Thompson Center. The preservation story of the James R. Thompson Center begins in August 29, 2009 when the building was just 24 years old. The pink and gray granite panels that provided a decorative element to clad the exterior arcade and covered the mock columns had begun to fall off and were secured with bands of stainless steel. Studies were conducted by Thornton Tomasetti to determine what caused this material failure and to repair them, but the Capital Development Board ultimately decided to re remove all 1,000 granite panels in October at a cost of $1 million. By the end of that year, the Illinois State Historic Preservation Office had issued a statement of eligibility for the Thompson Center. Preservation Chicago counted it in its, its Chicago seven threatened historic structures in 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019. It was named one of the nation's 11 most endangered places by the National Trust for Historic Preservation in 2019. Landmarks Illinois has added the Thompson Center to its statewide list of endangered buildings four times in 2017, 2018, 2019, and again in 2021, shortly after a request for proposals for the sale of the building and redevelopment of the site was released by the state. A public building for state administration and services, the Thompson Center posits a relationship between the citizen and the state in a way no building in Chicago had since Mies van der Rohe's uh, posthumously uh, completed federal center complex did a decade earlier. Where the federal center complex set separate buildings with different programs, an office tower, courthouse, and a post office asymmetrically in open plazas, the Thompson Center organized multiple programs in a single building around a circular interior atrium where the federal center sought to separate a government precinct from the life of the surrounding city by eliminating street level retail, the Thompson Center included multi-level shopping arcades and a major transit station, both inside and out, weaving the life of the street into the building. Where the federal center employed a starkly minimalist aesthetic to create a supposedly universal space, the Thompson Center used historically and culturally referential forms patterns and colors to identify the building with specific functions, places, and ideals. While the Thompson Center was refuting the modernist principles of the Federal Center, it was also re responding to the history of modernism in Chicago in complex ways. Its interior atrium referred to that in Burnham and Root's 1888 Rookery Building and its lobby renovated by Frank Lloyd Wright in 1905 with its exposed frame skylight, multiple entrances off the street, two levels of arcade style retail space and exuberant use of materials. Jan also nodded to the first Chicago school in his adaptation of Sullivan's tripartite organization for a tall building, including on the Thompson Center, a two level colonnade at base, a repetitive middle section or shaft and an expressive crown. There were even references to Chicago's art deco modernism in the stepped back form of the building on its south and east facades and the vertical striping on its glass facade. After the opening of the Thompson Center, postmodernism would gain popularity as a style for corporate, retail, institutional, and residential design. Notably, there would not be another major civic commission in Chicago in the style of the second Chicago school. In 1990, Five years after the completion of the Thompson Center, Hammond, B.B. and Bobka's Harold Washington Library Center would be the next major civic project in the city, and it was designed in the postmodern style. Occupying a full block site, the Washington Library included significant public interior spaces and sequences and used 
classical forms and details to reference specific ideals and communities and its function. Drawing heavily from the first Chicago school, the Washington Library was aesthetically very distinct from the Thompson Center's unabashed futurism, but the spell of the second Chicago school had been broken. In a city that was the cradle of modernism in America for 100 years, the Thompson Center prominently demonstrated that postmodernism was more than just a new look for architecture, but an evolution in keeping with its times, proving the capacity of postmodernism to tackle large and complex buildings and environments holistically. The Thompson Center redefined expectations for civic architecture and for urbanism. The building was immediately popular when it opened, drawing both nationwide published critical responses and large crowds from an inquisitive public. The locals are calling it the Starship and the Star Wars building, wrote critic Paul Goldberger in the New York Times in 1985. When it was dedicated a few weeks ago, the atrium was draped with a huge banner reading, a building for year 2000. And since then, the crowds have come to gawk as they have never had in any new building in downtown Chicago in years. And yet, from its opening, the Thompson Center elicited strong reactions and faced critique over its aesthetics, funding, and functionality. Often these critiques directly contradicted the presentation of the building by the state and the architect. The notion of the perceived aesthetic successes and failures of the state-owned structure was further explored by journalist, journalist Richard Locayo in the article titled, The Battle of Starship Chicago, published by Time Magazine for its February 4th, 1985 issue. With the writer declaring that the future forward building had transcended the two styles that dress most government structures, neoclassicism with its air judicious with its air judicious civic doings and modernism with its sober grids that speak to rectitude and rationality while simultaneously describing the building's pink and blue motif as tacky looking and its overall appearance as a civic structure that looks a bit like a celestial sports arena. When asked to comment on criticisms of the building's appearance and its choice of interior finishes and color schemes, Jan responded to Lakaya with an air of defiance, claiming that the Thompson Center was the type of building that takes time to digest and understand. Believing that the Thompson Center would try to become a future landmark, Jan retorted saying, just wait 20 years, someone will try to replace the blue panels and it won't be allowed. The state presented the building as one that encouraged openness in government, both from a symbolic and functional perspective. It is a building of openness and, and accessibility. To symbolize the openness and accessibility of government as it should be conducted, reads the state's official 1985 marketing pamphlet. In contrast, workers in the building complained that the irregular floor plates and open floor plan offices, now ubiquitous, but then a, then a novelty, made navigating the work environment difficult. Reporter Kevin Close further described the programming of the floor plans for the Washington Post in 1986, writing that the building's odd shape has altered the maze of offices within each ring. Some are square, some rectangular, some combinations are of some combinations of square and curved. Some have narrow pie-shaped corners, some have walls in no particular shape. Depending upon one's sense of direction, this can either be exhilarating or merely confusing. That's probably where the AIA guide got it, Michael. <laughs> Close went on to address the conflict between the building's ambitions to facilitate an open government apparatus and the practices of those working in it. All such complaints pale in the face of one big gripe. Many offices don't have doors. Even in a state where strong sunshine laws can make shutting one a civic sin, bureaucrats don't like to do without doors. The Thompson Center received positive critical attention for its role as a public space, transportation center and commercial mall. State had made the public component of the building key in its own literature. Where else can you meet a friend for a cup of coffee, enjoy a light snack or fill dinner, buy a suit, fill a prescription, visit an art gallery, a state agency, renew your driver's license, attend a concert and catch a train home, asked a state pamphlet, all without going outside. These uses were noted and affirmed by the public and highlighted in reviews of the complex. The mere presence of a 16 story atrium and a bunch of shops and eating places in a state office building turns it into a genuine public place, wrote Paul Goldberger in 1985. The building has already begun to establish itself as a kind of covered town square. It is filled with tourists, with workers, with Chicagoans who linger after doing businesses in state office offices. 
and with Chicagoans who are merely passing through its cylindrical atrium as a convenient means of cutting across a block. The Thompson Center even had a fan in Illinois poet laureate Gwendolyn Brooks, who called the building hard and bright and sassy with the seasons. Writing about the building's legacy and state of disrepair in 2014, Chicago architecture critic Blair Kamen focused on the building's ongoing role as a transit hub and center of activity in the city. To Kamen, this was a revolt of both its planning and its aesthetics. The building's pronounced curves and spatial excitement dispensed with the boredom of the steel and glass box. Instead of standing aloof from its urban surroundings, it engaged the city, linking with everything from downtown pipeway system to the CTA's elevated tracks. Kamen went on to praise the building's publicness and openness, its prized openness long before transparency became a buzzword. In June 2021, the Illinois State States Advisory Council, the official state appointed body to recommend places for listing on the National Register of Historic Places, voted in favor of the nomination of the James R. Thompson Center for National Register designation. This vote occurred against the state of Illinois' opposition to the nomination, against the Illinois, against the, um, the own office's determination that the building was ineligible for the National Register, and against a report commissioned by Ernst & Young Infrastructure Advisors, the firm tasked with choosing a buyer for the Thompson Center. This firm argued that the, the Thompson Center does not, did not have the dominant characteristics of postmodern architecture and was not one of Young's best design. The report was drafted by Chicago-based Okrent Keisel Associates, a firm known for both refuting local and national landmark designations. Um, we're going to head into some interior photos of the building. And just as a note um, of, of thought, these, uh, these photos of the interior are a week old. So they were taken last week. Despite multiple calls from preservation organizations and members of the public for the for the Chicago Landmarks Commission to consider landmarking the Thompson Center, Dep the Department of Planning and Development and the Landmarks Commission staff have declined to consider a preliminary designation for the building. Mayor Lori Lightfoot went on the record in 2019 as a supporter of protecting the Thompson Center, sharing with the Architects newspaper that year, as a lover of Chicago's architectural history in general, my first instinct will always be to protect historical treasures. Department of Planning and Development Commissioner Maurice Cox told the Chicago Sun-Times in 2020, I'm absolutely fascinated by the Thompson Center question and the idea that a postmodern icon is now considered historic. Yet neither Mayor Lightfoot nor Commissioner Cox, the self-described preservationist at heart, have acted to landmark the building. The National Register nomination was never brought to a Landmarks Commission program committee for consideration as a standard practice after a building in Chicago, in Chicago is approved for de designation by the Illinois Historic Sites Advisory Council. After the Illinois Historic Sites Advisory Council voted in favor of the nomination, the state delayed advancing the building to the National Park Service for nearly four months, during which time it continued to seek a buyer for the property. In November 2021, the nomination was returned to the Illinois SHPO by the National Park Service for minor revisions. Once the nomination was updated and returned to the state, the state delayed sending the updated nomination to the National Park Service a second time. In December 2021, the state of Illinois announced that the Thompson Center would be sold to Prime Group and initial renderings were released to the public. We cheered when we heard the news that the building was ostensibly saved but many questions remained, all of which we continue to interrogate. The concept of saving a building has always been more nuanced than saving it from demolition, as have we consider to be good, better, or best outcomes in preservation. The early renderings shown by Prime Group in 2021 are still the only set the public that have been released to the public, and they continue to be a distraction, one the public, one the public see, has first saw 18 months ago. They show the volume of the Thompson Center intact if bled of color. As the sale was finalized in March, 2022, it was announced that Google would make the Thompson Center its second Chicago headquarters, citing the high-tech architecture as a reason why the building had appeal. By August, 2022, the majority of state employees and most retail operations had vacated the building. In October, 2022, after reaching the final step before listing on the National Register of Historic Places at the National Park Service level, Prime Group declined to consent to the listing of the Thompson Center on the National Register, so the nomination was rejected. 
Yet preservation's regulatory framework prevailed. The National Park Service returned the nomination to the state with a determination of eligibility, which when delivered by the National Park Service as a federal agency, serves to provide the Thompson Center with a level of protection if and when federal permitting or funding is required during the renovation. Uh, this, just a, a note on the current status of the building, the interior is closed to the public, but there's still a Walgreens inside the building, a post office, and a Dunkin' Donuts that are um, functional and operational. And the outside of the building is um, completely accessed to the public, although there are barricades. So um, we, we hope that those of you in Chicago and nationwide, if you're in Chicago, you go to see it. Preservation um, is ongoing, but uh, this talk is coming to a close soon. Um, we began this evening by laying out some claims about the profession of preservation, um, both its faults and its potentials, and the importance of being ready as preservationists for a continually unfolding future. The challenges of preserving the Thompson Center have been cultural, intellectual, uh, and political. But the real challenge, um, we think, is uh, conceptual. What does it mean to declare a building preserved, saved? Uh, what makes uh, buildings more valuable? Their fixed pasts or their uh, continual presentness? This has been uh, thrilling for us to grapple with. Uh, all of these questions, challenges have been thrilling for us to grapple with, uh, befitting such a thrilling building. We know that the story isn't over yet. Thank you all for your patience with us. I think we came in at just about 40 minutes, Michael, um, and we hope there's time for uh, question and answer. Thank you. And um, there most definitely is. Um, I'm going to ask my question first and then see um, what folks have to say. Um, you did show the slide of um, Prentice Hospital in Chicago, and in 2013, I published an article in Next City um, opining that Prentice Hospital's impending demolition might be the Penn Station moment, you know, akin to the neoclassical Penn Station demolition that actually sparked the whole National Historic Preservation Act um, that modernism needed. And uh, my friend and, and very astute critic Alexander Lang responded, no. Nobody, there's not enough consensus. That's a beautiful building. Um, so then I thought, well, maybe the challenge is uh, to somehow uh, inhabit the space and that people, you know, the people who find it ugly to like lean in and say, okay, maybe you're right, but it still should be safe. So I'm going to ask you guys <laughs> how, how to approach that when somebody's just at the end of the day. And I mean, we tend to, uh, I think, especially raise this question of postmodern and modernist buildings. But we forget it was it was thrown at Penn Station. It was thrown yeah. at Victorian yeah. buildings. But yeah. how how do you like convert or like bridge the gap when somebody's like it's ugly, but you're you can somehow say, well, it still matters as a part of our past. Not all of our past is beautiful, right? But I don't yeah. know. The Will County Courthouse is another one. I think we're you've yeah. probably faced that, right? <laughs> yeah, a absolutely. Um, uh, you know, the, the 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 example that we're most familiar with and that I think we go to when this question comes up is the Chicago Cultural Center, although I think it applies to Penn Station as well. Um, the Chicago Cultural Center uh, is a gorgeous, uh, really resplendent uh, uh, neoclassical uh, uh, like machine. It is uh, has has multiple stained glass domes and detailing mosaics, um, intricate stonework. And in um, the 1960s and 1970s, there was consensus that it was uh, a waste of space. It could not be appropriately, uh, you know, the building systems were out of date. Its role as a library, it was no longer functional as a library. Um, and, uh, you know, that it should be demolished. And that's what the market wanted, right? The market said demolish it and make it a, a parking lot. We can make more money off of it. And that's what, what sort of general informed consensus was. And um, I think today, you know, we could all agree whatever we think about neoclassical style and, or, you know, or whatever, we can agree that it's a valuable thing for the city of Chicago to have held on to, ultimately to have restored and repurposed. Prentice Hospital, um, a brutalist, uh, uh, I think beautiful brutalist building, I, you know, it, it um, 
I agree with Alexandra's answer, I think, but but my my framing of it, and I'm curious for Elizabeth too, would be that there aren't necessarily Penn Station moments anymore. And that the kind of myth of the Penn Station moment and the formation of preservation is something that we have to kind of begin to work past. We can't rely on these reactive moments. Oh, we lost a beautiful gem. You know, now we have to include that category of things and things we save or we end up losing stuff and 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 we end up still with a very narrow ultimately you know view of what is and isn't valuable. Um so I would argue against the notion that we should be waiting for Penn Station moments for various historical styles uh, or that preservation should rely on them or expect them to move forward. The question of beauty though and and aesthetics and taste is straight on in this project. Um we just don't think whether we like the way a building looks as individuals or not should matter. Whether a, a building is valuable has to be able to be defined through other means and means that are less transitory and less uh, subjective. And um, it actually irks us when people talk about whether they think a building looks good or doesn't look good in a preservation context, although we know ultimately that does you know, move the public's opinion. Um, do, you, do you have a response? Do you want to talk about sort of how we tried to move the Thompson Center from being ugly to being pretty? Well, one of the things that I, I just would add to what Michael has said and what Alexandra has written and what Jonathan has just said is that but one of the big differences to me between um, Prentice and the Thompson Center and a lot of these other, um, th these other sort of preservation, I don't want to use like war monikers, but fights or battles, preservation fights or battles, is like, what is the level of public engagement for the building that's under threat? And with the Thompson Center, you know, you have this big public building that has been in use and in service to the people of Illinois since 1985, continuously. Um, Prentice Hospital is a, you know, it was a private hospital. Lots of babies were born there, but how many people were able to sort of go through Prentice Hospital on any given day? And I think that um, really kind of prevented the the public from really understanding, um, you know, the the a lot of the values of 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 Prentice Hospital. Even though we know we know it to be a loss, and we know it to be, um, you know, one of the I would say many Penn Station moments that we have in preservation. But I also feel like any one of our losses, like pick one, somewhere in that loss, there's something to learn. And if we have nothing to learn, then what are we doing here? Right. Well, well said. And I also think it's extremely difficult to win against hospitals and preservation battles, just given the nature. <laughs> we do have a comment in the chat from Philip Hegney that says, ugly or beautiful, it is a fascinating space. For that reason, it seems worthy of saving. Um, so that's that's fascinating. I like that. Uh, but since we're a small group, I don't know if anybody out there wants to uh, chime in with a question. Um, I don't think I need to wait for a raised hand since <laughs> not a not a huge crowd um, at this point. Um, does anybody want to ask a question? Uh, oh, I, we're not able to hear you. Sorry. You're muted somehow. <laughs> no. Try typing it in the chat. Still can't hear you, Frank. <laughs> oh, so sorry. Okay, I'm going to try to look at the chat. Okay, we're we're going to. There are just... a couple questions in the chat. Um, okay. Yeah, I can't look at the chat and also keep my well, maybe I can hold on. Yeah. Um from oh Kate, here we are. All right. Yeah. Um Kate, 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 and I don't know if I'm messing it up, but asks what lessons do you think other cities can learn from the challenges around the Thompson Center? Um, <laughs> um it's a good it's a great question. Um the I think part of the answer depends on on you know what you mean by city um we we took a lot of lessons i'll just say briefly from from uh, the, the the portland building uh michael graves's portland building in in portland oregon 
a building, the only other major postmodern building listed on the National Register, um, which uh, was at one point going through a, a, a preliminary delisting process because its owner uh, renovated it without uh, uh, following uh, guidelines of of you know for for its facade cladding. Um, but there weren't a lot of other examples of this type of challenge for us to look to and to model our effort on. Um, what I would say is at a couple of different levels, if there's an interest in preserving a public building, uh, preserving it while it remains a public building, uh, is uh, opens up in real value, right? That it's it's once the building moves into the private sphere, we are ultimately at the mercy of private ownership. Um, and we found in the process with the Thompson Center a real resistance on the part of the state of Illinois to admit to any uh, like historical eligibility for the building before it was out of their hands even when that eligibility would not have constrained their ability to sell it in any way. Um, the, the other advice I'd say for other, you know, for other municipalities and for other examples of, of, of buildings is, is that really working from the individual first, I think, is what made this process, in our view, a success. Um, we don't know the outcome yet of, we don't know where the building will stand, even with this deal with Google and Prime Group and, and the design by Jan, there are a lot of unknowns still. But we do feel that we moved the needle in public opinion and that um, that was and will continue to be very important to the building's ultimate preservation. And we did that by, by speaking, literally speaking to individuals, one, one by one in effect, or 10 by 10 in the form of tours and then other forms of kind of direct engagement. And we slowly built a, a, a um, constituency, you know, that valued the building and that was willing to talk to others about valuing the building. And um, that was part of a set of processes that were, and I should, we should be saying this all along, of other efforts by other members of our coalition and, and, and even others, you know, in the world to highlight the building's value. And it added a voice to it and it, it had an impact. Wonderful. I'm going to jump to Frank's question since he was so right. trying to try to get that in there. He is asking, are there any artifacts worth salvaging any original drawings? I would say in, in terms of the physical artifacts. Um, there's one right behind me over my shoulder, by the way. The well, there, there's actually, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I could, I could show everyone, but we have, um, there was a nail salon in the Thompson Center that I um, I went to <laughs> religiously because it was really nice and it was in the Thompson Center. Um, and when the nail salon closed, if I may move. You may, I'm um, gonna unplug our various. Okay. Uh, when the nail salon closed, um, I went into the nail salon and I asked, um, hey, so what um, what are you doing with this animated water flap, waterfall portrait? Um, so I bought it for $125. And now it's in our Preservation Futures office. Yeah. So um, I, I'd, I'd say that that's one of the artifacts, although um, you know, someone who collects or studies Louis Sullivan artifacts might say, oh, that's crap, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's not crap. Um, I, I feel like there's a lot of elements to the Thompson Center that um, are, there's, there's not individual pieces of, of terracotta. There's not, um, you know, fragments in the way that the National Building Arts Center has, but, you know, there's there's key components of the building, and we still don't yet know what exactly um, Jan is, is designing around in terms of the original attributes of the building, but I would say the uh, the interior street lights would you know look really great um you know maybe as you you drive into the National Building Art Center and you have those <laughs> those huge interior street lights there's just rows and rows of them um I I think the panels the color of the panels are really captivating I think you know having some of those as artifacts would be really great um and then you know also like the there's the the Piazza di Campidoglio floor it's um you know, there, there's there's portions of that that could be um, reinstalled elsewhere, and this you know might go back up to this might move into um, 
this question in the chat that I'm seeing about um, could we get into get more into the building systems issues? What is the feasibility of an energy retrofit? Um, the building has embodied energy. It has forty some odd years of almost forty years of embodied energy. Um, you know that's that's a part of the the value of of keeping the building around. Um, in terms of the systems, they haven't changed very much since 1985. So, um, you know, it, it whatever new go new thing goes in there for, for Google to enjoy um, or to survey survey us with um, will require a complete um, mm -hmm. renovation of the interior. Um, and then, of course, the exterior is. Um, it was kind of valued engineered the exterior of the building as single pane glass when it was supposed to be double pane. So, um, you know, that there, there are, there is a lot of sort of energy retrofitting and systems that need to be um, changed in the building. We could, but really, I mean, it hasn't been, um, it has a remarkable amount of integrity from the interior, um, from the interior to the exterior. There have been very little changes. There's still original furniture hanging around in the offices upstairs. So, um, you know, it, it it kind of gives an opportunity to sort of freshen everything with everything coming from one particular period. Yeah, it, it's. Um... I would add just briefly to that. First of all, it's a general, generally speaking, it's a really interesting question about postmodern buildings, and it links to all the earlier questions about what what do you what do you hold on to, right? There is no terracotta, there is no brick, there is no stone, and therefore, say some, there what is there to preserve? And so that is a, an interesting question and an interesting challenge. And th there actually are, as Elizabeth was saying, physical materials that are valuable, and then there are ways to think about aspects of the building that aren't physical, but that are valuable. Things like the actually the original color scheme, uh, right, which, um, you, you know, bears analysis. Um, one other thing I would add to what's in the building is, um, well, I'd supplement, I'd say it's absolutely a, so I, I, I um, my my mother worked in the Thompson Center as a state employee, uh, and and in 1985 she moved the office of you know from Wabash Avenue or wherever they were into the Thompson Center. And so I, as a as a young guy, um, remember running around on that carpet and like crawling on that furniture when it was all brand new. And it is literally the same carpet, literally the same furniture. Um, it is an extraordinarily intact 1980s interior. Um, and that is actually in and of itself very, very rare um, for good reason, right? Because generally the, the carpet is really worn out, right? So that actually is, a, there is value in that. Um, there's also a great collection of art is what I was trying to get to here. Uh, there was a program uh, in, in the state at the time, one per 2%, 1% 1 for the arts. And so a percentage of this enormous budget went to buying art by Illinois artists to be installed in the building, painting, sculpture, furniture, et cetera. And there's a spectacular collection of paintings by Chicago Imagists, um, some, some the monument with uh, Standing Beast, but also spectacular interior of uh, sculpture. And it's not clear what will happen to any of that. Um, building systems wise, um, the uh, yeah, the building has not the building went through one systems retrofit um, after its famous uh, air conditioning failures um, immediately after it opened. But really, since then, it, it hasn't been it hasn't been kept up. And any building that isn't kept up needs um, uh, you know ongoing maintenance and care. Um, fundamentally, there were a lot of numbers thrown around about the costs of this at the time that the state was looking to sell the Thompson Center. Fundamentally, its systems refit is straightforward, right? It's a curtain wall, it's a steel frame curtain wall structure. The cur current curtain wall can be removed. A newer, more sustainable one can be placed on it. And the aesthetics of that new one are up for grabs, right? The image on the screen is very, gen it, it shows what we hope is a very neutral, generic notion of something new, but uh, that glass could be ugly or it could be pretty in subjective terms. It could be historical or not historical in objective terms. And we would hope that it would be both more sustainable and historically accurate in terms of its color, materials, where, where possible, et cetera, proportion. Right. And, and certainly advocacy could play a role there. And there's a question that I'll 
jump to, and then we'll jump back to the one before. What's next in the process? What's going to happen? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, we saw from relatively far off that the, the National Register nomination was not going to be accepted by Prime Group. We were aware that the Prime, Prime Group team um, was not in favor of listing. Um, however, as Elizabeth pointed out, the um, National Park Service gave it a thumbs up, right? So it goes back to the state of Illinois as eligible for listing and therefore as legally a historical property. So at this point, um, you know, what the, what the National Register listing does is it says if federal money is going to be spent on something, a series of processes come into play for listed buildings that, that you know, require a slowing down of that process and a study of its impacts. And if any federal money were ever to come into play at the Thompson Center, it's possible that those processes could be triggered, right? So it's it, it doesn't happen automatically. It would have to, right? It, it, <laughs> so yes, careful ongoing um, oversight of the process by the public is important and we're trying to do that. Um, it's also possible no federal money will come into play. That seems unlikely to us actually because of the, the CTA station and a, a series of other you know, utility issues on the site. So that's one, that's one area where, where the, the state might come in. We have a change of administration going on right now in, in the city and local landmarking remains on the table. Um, we're frustrated that the city hasn't um, taken up the question of landmarking the Thompson Center. We believe this is actually the perfect time to do it. We have a private buyer who seems interested in a, a, a substantive renovation that's, in their words, historically sensitive. Um, why not do that, at least in collaboration with the Landmarks Commission, so that the public has some ongoing say, some ongoing control over this formerly public asset. Um, that doesn't have to look like freezing the building in, in amber, right? Wrigley Field here in Chicago is landmarked, but it's landmarked in a highly flexible way that allows um, the, you know, the franchise's owners to keep it operational as a contemporary ballpark slash off-site off bedding facility now without, without um, disrupting its landmark status, right? But it gives the public a say in what is, you know, what is an icon of, of Chicago. Um, so those are two, two processes that we think are important. We're waiting to see what the, what the plan is. We're waiting to see what the actual design intent of Google, Prime Group, and Jan um, looks like. And we're prepared for it to look a lot better than what's on the screen right now. And we're prepared to support it on that basis. So we actually um, are ourselves torn. We love the building. We love, you know, let's be very specific. It's color scheme. And we think it's color scheme is really valuable. Is it a loss? Is it a preservation loss? Is it a Penn Station moment if that color scheme disappears? No, um, right? It, 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 we'd take it as a personal loss. We'd regret it. We'd think it would be a loss to architectural history and, and potentially to the city, but it's not a forever loss. It could, it could be restored at a later date, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and by the way, the building continues to hold its embodied energy. It continues to serve as a public transit hub. It continues to do lots of things we would hope that it did in the past. Um, but, um, you know, is the building closed to the public, right? Then, you know, it's suddenly it's not acting, as, you know, in that in that way anymore. So we're waiting to see what what that looks like. And, and I think kind of waiting strategically from our point of view and, in, in, you know, in terms of our operations to 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 uh, till that moment to decide what what our next steps are. Great. There are two, two other questions that I'm going to go, uh, well, I don't know, which is the easier or the hard one. I think this is the easier one, maybe. Can you comment on any of Jan's other buildings that are at risk of demolition, and to what extent is his larger uh, oeuvre or, or body of work factoring into reimagination efforts for the Thompson Center? I think we've already touched on that as the second part of that question, but the first part, are there any other Jan threats out there? And Not, not that I'm aware of. Um, and Jan is. I mean, what, Jan we could also note the rebuilding of O'Hare May. May. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Area. I okay. I I would I would say yes. The um, 
the O'Hare renovation, but like hospitals, um, airports are hard. Um, we we love, uh, what is it, the sky's the limit? The terminal between um, the, 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 tunnel. the tunnel in the United terminal. We, we love that. And that's like such a nice exuberant part of Helmut Jan's work, but you know, airports sort of being airports and, and you know, we know the, the, the matrices of renovating airports might not be particularly kind to um, sky's the limit or that, that underground terminal. Um, Jan, it, Jan is interesting because they, um, they're they coming close to topping off 1000M, which is um, going to be another one of our, um, our millennium modern skyscrapers here in Chicago, which we can kind of just barely see from the office here. Um, so Jan is still building big projects as a firm. Um, they are the architect of record for the renovation. So, um, you know, it's exciting to see what the future is in terms of their, um, you know, their, their connections with their own history. And I, I feel like it's a little bit complicated, although um, Helmut Jan was always very supportive in giving us the information that we needed. Um, it's, it's hard with postmodernism to mount sort of a, a preservation advocacy effort, not only from a legislative or policy standpoint, but also from a public standpoint. But I, I will say that the um, the library in, gosh, I forgot the name of it. Michigan, Michigan City. City in yeah. Michigan City is um, was recently renovated. The renovation was um, quite sensitive and it's a very well used, very light filled, beautiful, active library. So, um, you know, I, I hope that his the the projects by Jan um, that are sort of on the earlier side of the firm's um, the the firm's history are um, you know right after the Thompson Center the saga is sort of happening um, they're given a little bit more attention. We saw that with the demolition apprentice, which led to I think um, the yeah. Marina City being landmarked, which I think was sort of like. Oh, preservationists, you were mad about um, Prentice being demolished. Well, we're going to give you a little carrot. We're going to give you a little little brutalism as a treat. And um, we're going to landmark the, uh, the Marina City Towers. This process definitely made us um, yawn, you know, fan people. Um, we learned a lot about the practice and a lot about the other buildings. Um, we're not aware of active threats, but, but you know, it, it, it to Elizabeth's point about how so many of Jan's buildings are so um, remain so successful today because of their design, um, this host of Chicago skyscrapers that Jan did really before the Thompson Xerox building, uh, the LaSalle Street, the, the, the expansion to the Board of Trade, um, these were always successful buildings from the point of view that they worked, they had tenants, right? They, they were financially successful. Um, the the Thompson Center really was a transitional work, and um, you know people would always say about it, well, it's you know it's it's a it was a it's full of mistakes, it doesn't work well, and, you know maybe we just didn't quite know how to use it yet, is I think one of the thoughts that we had about it, but um, but no, we're not aware of other active threats. Right. Last question. Sorry. Yes, and I think this is <laughs> unless somebody wants to jump in with the chat um, in the, in a few minutes, but this is. One from our archives and collections manager, Emery Cox, and um, maybe it is the hard one um, for all of us who practice historic preservation. Um, he writes that historic preservation laws and rules tend to be merely advisory. They have no teeth. Uh, that seems to be the case here. Is there any proposed or pending legislation in Chicago or elsewhere that would have some sort of enforcement? Or will the world of capital and developers never go for it? Ooh. Mic drop. <laughs> have wow. us have us back for another lecture on just this topic, because boy, do we have a lot to say about it. I feel like we, the whole field of preservation needs to have a <laughs> focused symposium. Um, um, yeah, with, and there's with also commi with commitment pledges, not just the usual talking heads, and then we go back and five years later have the same conversation. <laughs> No, I yeah, I'm, I'm, has to do its work, and the consultants have to do their work, and <laughs> we come back and we check in on progress. Yeah, what is what is the the use of of 
but preaching if you're not going to also practice it. Don't bother. Don't bother preaching if you're not going to practice. Um, I lose teeth. The teeth are in, not in our mouth. Um, yeah, the, oh yeah, you that's did, oh that's that's you, that's. you mentioned the landmark law. Well, this could be landmark tomorrow if Maurice Cox and the mayor wanted it to be right, and then there would be solid regulation of the exterior and potentially, you know, the the color scheme, right? At least um, depending on how far your law could go. But those aren't our teeth. Those, are, you no, know, yeah, it, yeah, it doesn't. We we don't we don't have the teeth. I I wish, um, I I, I often wish that. Um, in terms of national register properties, and 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 there's a, an amount of confusion, or or um, um, maybe there, there's an amount of education that that I I I think that both Jonathan and I, and I'm sure Michael too, feel responsible for. Where you know there's a difference between different preservation, um, how how preservation act is functions as legislation or policy. So it's the local ordinances that have teeth, but you know what level of, of, of teeth or what level of enforcement do they have? It's sort of different in every place. The National Register, um, unless there's a matrix that involves uh, federal funding or a federal permit, um, you know, a, a, a private developer, even Prime Group could demolish the Thompson Center tomorrow. Um, and it's the same thing with um, local landmarking. It's like it's it's not locally landmarked, so the Thompson Center could be demolished by Prime Group tomorrow. And that's one of the things that I think um, you know in watching in watching the excitement that um, some of the, uh, the the development community and the architecture community and and some of our folks in local government. They're very excited that Google is putting their second world headquarters in the Thompson Center. But, um, and they've also um, created this entire initiative to redevelop um, redevelop commercial buildings on LaSalle Street for um, residential use. So it'll be a mix of affordable and market rate housing. And that whole, it's called the South Street Reimagine. The entire the South Street Reimagine initiative is based on the Thompson Center being redeveloped for Google's use. And there's nothing, um, as far as I know, as far as we know, that prevents um, Prime Group from ostensibly yeah, demolishing torpedoing it, yeah. torpedoing it yeah. tomorrow. Um, and landmarking would preserve that investment. It would preserve the ability for you know all of the the initiatives that have gotten the LaSalle Street reimagined project going it would preserve that investment too so um yeah and landmarking is um landmarking has teeth actually in Chicago the the landmarks ordinance in Chicago has teeth the problem is that it's landmarking things is the problem yeah the the, the problem is that the the process is not there isn't a public process there isn't a transparent public process. And that's why this clearly eligible site, an urgent site for consideration, can't be considered by the, the, the body of Chicago citizens, the Landmarks Commission, uh, that's actually charged with making these decisions or informing these decisions, right? So that's where I think we're stuck. We're stuck in the fact that th we can't even get this building in front of that commission, presumably because Lightfoot Cox don't want it there. Um, but that's where the stopping point seems to be. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I'm trying to think of a good tooth metaphor here, um, but uh, I can't because it's late in the day. So <laughs> I'll say thank you for all these great questions and for all of your patience and and um there's great we've seen great things in the chat but we've been unable to read them all um but uh <laughs> Emory was yeah, um, not related to Maurice Cox I, I see that now <laughs> right thank you <laughs> um but but we really appreciate everyone's attention and we we hope that this is the start of more conversations uh with each of you and we'll we'll review the comments uh we'll review the comments after the talk uh, to hear from all of you Thank you so much, everyone. And, and we are familiar with a lot of the names that are here um, listening in on this presentation. So thank you all for, um, thank you many of you for your support of this work and your interest and um, 
we we're so glad that we have an audience and we're so glad that you are into this because we certainly are right thank you so much elizabeth and jonathan this was riveting and a great uh place for us to land for national historic preservation month our first ever inaugural national historic preservation month lecture um we hope to have you back at some point maybe in person in st louis um, to that end, again, to follow up for those who were not here at the beginning, uh, please check out National Building Arts, um, dot, um, Nurse, National Building Arts Center website and our social media. We have a tour this uh, Saturday. We're starting our uh, summer lectures in person in June, uh, July, and August. Um, we're bringing the Statue of Liberty, or at least the replica, to St. Louis, and we want you to follow those that news. And in September, we open our first major exhibition at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation. If you can keep up with all that. Um, maybe you'll have a job here. Um, but we really yeah. hope, uh, hope hope you enjoyed this uh, presentation. Thank you for your attendance. Um, this will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. Um, so um, good night. Be well. Enjoy the rest of your National Historic Preservation Month. Uh, go out and save some things. Save the world entire, and we'll all do better. Peace. Good night. Thank you, everybody.